Everyone has heard a story about God answering a need with a miracle. Maybe you are fortunate enough that the story in your mind is your own story. But even if it's not, even if you have not experienced such a thing, I'm sure you have heard such a story from a family member or a friend or a church brother and sister, maybe even from an evangelist who came and visited one time. One such story that I uh, am familiar with had to do with a young woman named, I'm not even going to give you her real name. I'll call her, uh, what am I going to call her? I'll call her Cassie. Okay. This is a woman who was one of my members many years ago, and she was roughly my age. She had a father um, who was stricken with cancer. And this poor dude, uh, it was operable. But it was cancer. I mean, it's not like the end of the world in terms of how cancers can go, but it was a big deal. And he was scheduled to, uh, to have surgery to try to remove the tumor. And this was confirmed. I mean, his blood work was all over the place and he had scans and whatnot. They knew exactly where they were going into the body to find and remove this thing. But he was in kind of frail health. I forget the details. It was long ago, enough ago that the operation was not just supposed to be straight forward. You know, there were other risk factors involved. So we were nervous and this woman, Cassie came to church every week for prayer meeting and had the same prayer request. Lord, heal my dad, bless the doctors, get him through this operation in, uh, in a way that he can be restored to health in Jesus name. Amen. So the day of the operation comes. And the church is united in prayer. And this poor man gets his medicine, goes under, and the doctors open him up. And what do you think they found? Someone's going to give me the right answer. What do you think they found when they opened him up? They found nothing. They found nothing there. <laughs> and apparently, and I was not in the operating room, so I got this all secondhand, but apparently like they were so shocked to not find anything there that they consulted their previous tests to make sure they hadn't made an error. But there it was on the tests and there it was not inside the person. You can imagine Cassie came back to prayer meeting the following week, just praising the Lord. As one such story, God answered with a miracle and cancer free. I mean, he went for follow up tests and it was like he never was sick in the first place. Hallelujah. Another story that happened um, within a week of me being baptized. So we're going back all the way back to then. I was baptized on a day when there were, I think, two other baptisms besides myself. One was a long-standing Christian man, not an Adventist, who was learning the Adventist faith, and now he wanted to be re-baptized, or baptized for the first time into the Christian faith, the Adventist faith. And also a woman who was already an Adventist but was feeling recommitted, she wanted to be re-baptized. I was also... Um, being baptized by immersion for the first time in my life. So this man, this other dude who was baptized on the same day as me, he was dying. He had all sorts of problems. He needed two, not one, two new lungs. This man, in fact, had discovered us as the Adventist church because he knew he was dying, so he went to every single Christian revival event that he could find. He went everywhere there were Christians. He went there to be in their presence and pray to their God, right? It was his God too, but you, you see the point. He was just desperate for God. And so he found out about our series of meetings, and he came to us for the same reason. I'm dying, and I need the Lord. So he's baptized into the faith. And uh, then he was not at Sabbath the following, uh, not at church the following Sabbath. So we're all worried about him, right? He had a twin sister. She was in church the following week on Sabbath, but not he. So we're all very concerned. Hey, how's your brother doing? We, we were praying about him. We didn't see him. Is he okay? What happened? 
This man had been on a transplant list for a long time. A long time. I mean, this is not his first rodeo here. But he was baptized in the name of Jesus into a Sabbath-keeping faith. And something like four days later, two brand new lungs became available for him. <laughs> and he had the operation, and he now was not dying for the same reason anymore. I mean, there are all sorts of other issues that come with organ transplant, and he had to deal with those too. But you can, can you imagine the feeling inside the church when we got that report? He'd been waiting for organs for months, if not years. And then he gets baptized into a Sabbath-keeping faith, and within days, he's now under the knife to get two brand new lungs. Two brand new lungs. I'll tell you, as a brand new baby Christian, that had a big, big impact on me. I said, I serve a God who intervenes. Praise the Lord. There are other such stories. You've heard them all the time. Anytime a ministry wants you to give them your money, it's going to come with a story like this. I used to write for Amazing Facts. It was my job for a while to find these stories and put them in printed form so that they could be emailed to you with an appeal for money. <laughs> and we often, even when we take money out of the equation, we use the same idea for evangelism. Hey, man, you look really broken. What's wrong? Oh, I'm, you know, my family's falling apart and I have this chronic condition and everything's a mess. And we say like, hey, come to our meetings. Do you know Jesus? No, I don't know Jesus. Come to our meetings. You're going to get to know the Lord and he's going to take over your life as you give it to him and he'll make everything better. He's the God of all creation and the healer and your life will improve. And I say, praise the Lord. Are you serving dinner? <laughs> and then... They come and they find their faith and everything is well because God is faithful. But I'm going through all this because we have a problem. This is an excellent model most of the time. But we're not in most of the time, are we? Our eschatology, do you know what that word means? Eschatology, it's a, it's a word from Greek, the Greek word eschaton. It means the final things. And so eschatology is the theology of the end times. And our particular eschatology, wherein we believe there's a time of trouble and the rise of Babylon and kind of a global oppressive power and the triumph of paganism and the mark of the beast and all that stuff. Our eschatology turns the entire paradigm that I just went through on its absolute head because our eschatology tells us things will not always get better. All the time, even right now, people die, even when they're not being prayed, even when they are being prayed over. Have you ever been united in prayer for someone's healing and then the person dies anyway? Of course. All the time, marriages divorce and families crumble, even while a church prays for it. All the time, wars begin. Like since Genesis chapter four, war has been a reality here on planet earth. All the time wars begin and continue even, like you would think the world has been bathed in prayer for the ending of this conflict in Ukraine. You would think it would be over by now, but it's not. And so even in the regular real world, we are plagued with unanswered prayers and problems that don't get better. And our eschatology points us to a time when that will get even worse. Babylon will rise, regardless of how much we pray against it. And it will happen that way because it is written. And as time waxes old, we are promised that the winds of strife will be released. Revelation 7 verses 1 through 3 the angels are holding back the winds of strife until a certain point. And when God's people are sealed in their foreheads, then he allows the winds to be released. So as the church is sealed for the task ahead of it, the world will get worse. That's what prophecy promises us. And so we have to kind of wrestle with that. 
our job to represent Jesus Christ is to minister the hope that we find in Jesus. But where is the divine hope when medicine has failed and no miracle is coming? Where was the divine hope when Annie drew her last breath, even though we were all praying that it would go differently? Where is the divine hope when addiction wins? Where is the divine hope when divorce papers are signed? Where is the divine hope when our children disappear, either because they want to disappear or because someone else wants them to disappear, right? Intentionally or unintentionally, when they go away, where's the hope? Where is the divine hope for the family starving to death in the cold or in the desert? Where is the hope for the church when Babylon ascends to power, never to be dislodged from power on this side of heaven? This is the way the world works. <laughs> this is the way the world always has worked. We call these miraculous interventions from God, we call them miracles because that's not how things usually happen. It's out of the ordinary when it happens. It takes us by surprise because most of the time the world is the way it is. I have a theory. It's a Laodicean theory. We believe, prophetically speaking, we are living in the time of Laodicea. We believe we are rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, even though Christ has a very, very different um, prescription for us. We are actually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We just don't realize it. And it seems to me that we are so Laodicean. And I'm not, I'm not scolding you, right? This is a church-wide problem. We collectively are so Laodicean, so first world in our experience, so accustomed to having a medicine for every ailment and a credit card for every expense. We have the general expectation that the baby in your tummy is going to be born and grow to adulthood. We can expect pretty solidly that war is not going to consume our neighborhoods or even our retirement accounts. We are so rich, increased with goods and in need of nothing that we may have forgotten what life on earth is really like for most people. We are so very comfortable and very complacent that we seek the Lord's blessing we seek the return of all of those comforts when they're taken away. That's the blessing we're often asking for. Lord, restore to him his job or find him another one. Lord, bring her the funds that she needs to repair her car so she can go back to work. Lord, grant him victory in court today. Lord, heal this condition or this disease. Bring me back to health. And in all of this, we kind of forget that the way that we live is an anomaly. It's a historical anomaly. For most of human history, the struggle was different. The struggle was just staying alive day to day. The struggle was not, Lord, find me a carpool so I can save on gas money. Do you see the point I'm getting at here? We say, oh no, gas is five and a half dollars a gallon. It costs me so much to go to work. Lord, send me a carpool. <laughs> Most people in the world are saying, Lord, send me some food so I survive to the end of the day. At least, maybe not at this moment in time, but historically speaking, humanity has not been nearly as rich and as comfortable as all of us are, even the poorest of us in this room. For much of early church history, so we're talking one, two, three hundreds AD, their struggle was surviving the worship hour, even though the Jews and the Romans wanted to kill them. Do you have the general expectation when you get in your car to come to church Sabbath morning that maybe, just maybe, a marauding 
persecuting army is going to come and cut you in half before you go home? Probably not, right? That's probably not our experience. But it was our ancestors in the faith experience. Their prayer was not, you know, Lord, take away my mild discomfort. Their prayer was, Lord, give me strength whether I die at the stake or in the Colosseum. It wasn't even, Lord, take away the Romans. No, I'm going to die. They're going to feed me to the lions or they're going to burn me to death. Lord, give me grace and strength to meet the challenge in front of me so I can die with, with Christian dignity. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of us have ever prayed a prayer like that? For most believers throughout time, and even for many believers today, the true and only divine hope is found in Christ's words in John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me, says Jesus. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also. When you are tied to a stake and they are setting the wood on fire and you've got 40 seconds to go before your t life is taken away, this is the only hope you have. This. This was so profound to the early Christian church this passage was often referred to as the promise. Now, you, you and I know well, there are hundreds of promises in Scripture, but this was the only one that was available to them in those dark days, and they called this the promise. Rome, you can take away my house. You can take away my family. You can take away my riches. You can take my life, but you cannot take my salvation. You cannot take my Lord. And I will live in his kingdom with him forever, no matter what you do to me. In Jesus' name, amen. This was the hope. Often their only hope. And I think that we, in the first world, in the Laodicean era, need to reconnect with this hope, which is ultimately the only true hope of the Christian. I ask you to remember from two weeks ago, last time I was here, I reminded you that we're halfway through a Sabbath year right now. Six months down, six months to go. And since then, I've actually researched the exact date of Yom Kippur, which is the Jewish New Year. It's at the end of September. They're on a lunar calendar, so it's not always the same time every year. So the Sabbath year itself ends at the end of September. Therefore, whatever fulfillment comes, it could be anywhere around that, right? anytime in September or October, or hey, I'm not a prophet, who knows, we're all going to find out together. But I suggested we've got something probably pretty big coming in a few months. Uh, we saw how Ellen White wrote down prophecies of the last 20 years that have been fulfilled pretty perfectly and in the order in which she wrote them. Well, we also saw how the next thing in that prophecy is a quotation from a passage in the book of Isaiah, which talks about a worldwide loss of joy and a collapsing food supply and war. So, is that a hopeful message? How do we share the hope of Jesus Christ with that message? Hey, you're not feeling so great? Come to church with me. We're going to learn how the world's going to end soon. That poses a problem for us, doesn't it? Now, you and I know what all this chaos means. We've studied our prophecy. We're mature in our faith, hopefully in theory. So we know that Christ will come in victory, hallelujah, and that no matter our physical condition on that day, even if we're in the grave on that day, we will rise in immortality to live forevermore in his perfect kingdom without sin and without end, hallelujah. We know that. We can have that hope when we see all this chaos. But they're not going to know that. 
even if we tell them accurately what's going to come, we're still not addressing how those events are making them feel in their heart. We haven't actually given any hope. It gets even worse, right? If we, if we dwell on this, we recognize that the world is in chaos because the devil knows that his time is short. And he and his demons are in a panicked overdrive, like a dog trapped in a corner trying to just fight for his own existence. And he's trying to gain as much power and support as he can for the battle of Armageddon. That is the bad, inescapable, scriptural reality of what prophecy says is still to come. Where is the hope in that? There is good news. There is hope. The good news, the very gospel that we are called to preach to every tribe, kindred, uh, tongue, and nation is that no matter how powerful the devil may be in that day, Jesus Christ wins the day. He rescues his church. He raises his people from the grave. He imprisons the devil and slays the devil's army and then establishes his own kingdom of righteousness that shall never end. Can I get an amen today? That's the good news. The good news is not that somehow bad things aren't coming. The good news is that despite the bad things, something better is on its way. Jesus Christ is coming to collect his people so that where he is, there we may be also according to his promise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing to Jesus. His the scepter. His the throne. Alleluia, his the triumph, his the victory alone. Amen. Or as it says in Revelation 19, verses 6 and 7, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. That's you and I shouting this. When we make it, when we're in his kingdom, sitting down at the marriage supper of the Lamb, you and I are saying those words if we have faith enough to get there. This is the hope that we have to offer, and increasingly it will be the only hope that we have to offer. Because at some point, and who knows, maybe already, but definitely at some point, the world is not going to get any better. We cannot offer the hope that things will get better. What we can offer is the one, the very one who will replace this world with a better one and invite along anyone who is willing to come. I wish you were excited about that church. I really do. We can offer Jesus. We can offer the one who will replace this broken world with a righteous world and bring with him into that world anyone who wants to be there. Do you want to be there today, church? Amen. We need two things first before we can offer this kind of hope to the world. <clears throat> Number one, we need to know Jesus ourselves because we cannot give away that which we don't have ourselves. Okay? So we actually need to know Jesus if we want to offer him to other people. And what does that mean? Well, I mean, it means probably something different to everybody, but it means having a relationship with Jesus. And, you know, what are the kinds of things you need to do to have a relationship with someone? You have to be in conversation, right? You have to spend time. They have to be part of your lives. I mean, would anybody take my marriage seriously if I went years and years without seeing or talking to my wife? No, right? We need to know Jesus ourselves in a real way. 
not know him through through the pastor's experience or my brother's experience or the guy in the pew across from me's experience, but my own experience to know Jesus intimately like that. Then, once we've got that, the second thing we need is to believe that he is coming soon in order to give the hope to someone that he's coming soon. And I was just talking about this last night. It's been my experience that even amongst God's remnant people, there is a strong uh, tendency to either deny that Jesus is coming at all or to acknowledge that that is true, but push it off beyond the expectation of your natural life. You know, like, oh yeah, I think Jesus is coming soon and I'll probably be dead in the next 20 years. So Jesus is definitely coming in 30 years. You know, and we just push it off just far enough in our minds that we think we're not going to have to deal with it directly. I would like that to change. The very first, se- I told this last night too, the very first senior pastor I ever studied under told me he didn't believe Jesus was coming soon. Is that shocking to you? It was shocking to me. It's still shocking to me. 11 years later. And I'm not going to ask you how many of you also really don't believe Jesus is coming soon because I don't want you to tell me. I would rather believe, I'd rather stay in my belief that all of you think Jesus is coming soon, okay? But anyway, regardless of how you feel, we need these two things. We need to know Jesus personally and we need to believe he is coming soon if we want to be equipped to give this kind of hope to the world around us even as everything falls apart. So do you have nagging doubt? Are you one of those people like my very first senior pastor and a couple of the current pastors that I work with right now who say some version of, well, but you know, my parents said that Jesus was coming soon when I was a kid and then they died and he hasn't come and now I'm a grown up and I'm married and have my own kids and he's not here and so I just don't want to make the same mistake my parents did so he's not going to come soon. Is that you? Because the time for nagging doubt is, is, is past. We have to let that go forever. We have to be sure of our faith and confident. So do you need some evidence to bolster your faith? I, I, won't, I won't condemn you if you do. I'm skeptical by nature too. But we've got some evidence coming, I believe, in about six months. Because Jesus says, now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. And right there is the entire point of prophecy. It's so that when we see the things that Jesus said were going to happen actually happen, it's supposed to strengthen our faith. We might believe that Christ is who he says that he is. So I've suggested to you that about six months from now, we're going to see the next piece of Ellen White's prophecy fulfilled. And I am not a prophet, so I can't promise you that's going to happen. But if it does, I'd like you to remember that Jesus said ahead of time it was going to happen, that our faith might be strengthened, that we might believe. All right, so now we're confident in our faith. We're giving this hope of the second coming to the world around us. What else is there? Pastor, I want to go to heaven. I want to be in that second coming, first resurrection. What's it going to take? How can I be sure? Well, I think that's a big question, probably best for a different sermon, but I'll tell you where to start. We're going to start in our scripture passage that Sister Rena read to us. Paul writes, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And that's important. I included that on purpose. He's at the end of his life. He is not hoping to be released or to be healed or to continue to live. He's not asking a first world prayer like we are so frequently commonly praying. He knows his life is just about over. And the time of my departure is at hand, he says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, he has hope anyway, even though his life is almost over, even though he knows he's never going to see a lot of his friends again, and he's going to close his eyes in death until Jesus returns. He says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me on that day. Hallelujah. And not to me only, 
but to all who have loved his appearing or longed for his appearing, as it said in the translation that was read earlier. Church, do you long for and love the appearance of Jesus Christ? That's where we start. Maybe I don't have the kind of rock-solid prophetic faith that the pastor's talking about today. Maybe I have a lot of work still to do before I reach that place. But you know what I can say is that I love the return of Jesus Christ and I want to be there. I want to be in that great day. I want to meet my Lord in the air. I long for his appearing in Jesus' name. Amen. We have to love his appearing, church. And we, give, we have to teach others to do the same. Because when we inevitably run into the people whose addictions are winning or whose cancer is winning, or whose marriage is ending, or who is flat broke and cannot get his or her legs under, under themselves, we won't be able to always fix these problems. But we can always point them to the kingdom which is to come. Let's remember that, amen? And let's never lose hope. No matter how many elections we wish go a different way, no matter how expensive gas gets, no matter what happens, no matter how messy our jobs or our families become, we have this hope that cannot be taken from us. Hope in the coming of the Lord.